Insightful podcasts by informative hosts. Insights into Things, a podcast network. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow, where we take a deeper look into how the issues of today will impact the world of tomorrow, from politics and world news to media and technology. We discuss how today's headlines are becoming tomorrow's reality. Welcome to Insights into Tomorrow. This is episode nine, Entertainment a la Carte. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and my co-host, Sam Whalen. Hi, everyone. How you doing today, Sam? I'm doing all right. How you doing? Doing all right. So aside for the landscapers that we're dealing with here, but that's okay. <laughs> Uh, so this week we decided to sort of ratchet it down a few notches. We've been having a last couple of podcasts we've done. We've been doing some pretty heavy hitting, timely subjects. And with the uh, election not too far away, uh, we knew we were probably going to be doing another heavy hitting one to cover that. So this week we're going to do something a little more lighthearted, uh, a little more fun and a little less dipped in controversy i guess i could say yeah so if you're filling out your bingo cards about how we're going to get to the end of the world by the end of this i don't know if you're going to win this time <laughs> uh, but we'll yeah, see. hopefully we won't have doom and gloom by the end of the show like we usually do uh so this week we're talking entertainment a la carte and when i say that there has been a desire by consumers for a very long time now to have entertainment the way they want it at their fingertips when they want it. We've had different false starts, different incarnations, different hopes that we've seen through the industry. So today we're going to take a look at sort of what the history of what we've had, uh, what we've got today, and where we think we're going to be going in the future as far as what our command over our entertainment is going to be. Before we do that, though, I did want to invite folks to subscribe to the podcast. You can catch us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, and now on Amazon. So you can convince your Echo devices to listen to our podcasts. I would also invite folks to reach out to us, tell us if we're doing a good job, what you'd like us to talk about. You can email us at comments at insightsintothings.com. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. You can catch high-res versions of our videos on YouTube at youtube.com slash insightsintothings. We do stream six days a week, this week seven days a week, on Twitch at twitch.tv slash insightsintothings. You can catch our audio versions of the podcast at podcast.insightsintotomorrow.com. You can reach out to us on Facebook at facebook.com slash insightsintothingspodcast. Or you can get links to all of our social media on our website at insightsintothings.com. Ready to get into it? Yes. All right. <laughs> So first up, I just wanted to sort of uh, kind of summarize what we look, what we're looking at when it comes to entertainment here, uh, and how important entertainment is in the home. But before we do that, let me ask you, Sam, what aspects of entertainment are important to you? Do you listen to music? Do you stream videos? Do you watch movies? What's your what's your prescription for your entertainment? Um, I'd say I mostly watch, uh, I watch a lot of YouTube. Like I follow a lot of channels and watch content on there. Um, and then from there it's probably like Netflix. Um, I don't really watch live TV, TV at all anymore unless it's like a football game or something. And even then I'm only watching 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so for me, it's definitely mostly YouTube, um, podcasts, like things on Stitcher. I listen to a lot of things on there. Um, and, uh, yeah, Netflix, they're, they're like the big three for me. 
So what, what about radio? I know, you know, with the, the college and everything that uh, you have, you know, you are, you have a presence on broadcast radio. Do you listen to broadcast radio yourself much? Um, if I'm in the car, like on the car road over here, I definitely listen to it. Like I don't, I don't have Bluetooth in the car or anything like that. I'll put on, you know, sports talk radio or, or uh, MMR or something like that. Um, other than that, I don't really just tune on the radio just for fun. Um, like in the mornings when I'm getting ready, I'm usually listening to a podcast. It's not so much the radio. Um, when I was younger, I used to do that a lot until I got into podcasts. Um, sometimes, you know, if I'm taking a shower, I'll put the radio on. Um, but overall, I'd say not really that often. It's mostly in the car. Okay. Yeah. And and how about movies? Do you do you have do you own DVDs or Blu-rays or do you stream most of your movies today? I'm mostly streaming. I mean, I have I'd say probably like 30 to 40 maybe Blu-rays and a couple, you know, 4Ks and things things like that. Movies that I really want to have, you know, the physical copy of, movies that I are special to me or movies that I just like a lot um or movies that I got on sale <laughs> for right. Blu-rays cuz Amazon does Blu-ray sales all the time. Um, so things like that, I don't have like a, like, I wouldn't say my Blu-ray collection is like my pride and joy. Um, but it's mostly just to have those physical copies just in case, you know, I can't get the Lord of the Rings on, you know, Netflix cause they take it off all the time or something like that. Right. Right. So it, it sounds like a, a good chunk of what you do is, is some of the more modern technologies yep. then. Mm -hmm. What about when you listen to radio, do you, is it talk shows you listen to is it music that you listen to or you listen to the sports radio yeah it's mostly i mostly do sports talk you know 94.1 for our local area that's like the sports and then there's 97.5 too i'll alternate between those um i don't really listen to music that much i don't know something about hearing people talk and discuss i just like to listen to that more than you know a song i can pull up on well, my phone you know as a podcaster that's exactly what <laughs> i like to hear yeah. Well, it's nice to not hear my own voice, you know. It's nice to hear other people talk for a while. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, we've had various forums, and, and we're going to talk about the history of some of these forums uh, in a little bit there. But obviously, we, we our entertainment started out as purely live entertainment. If you went, you know, back in the 1800s and in the beginning of the 1900s, if you wanted to be entertained, you either produced music or entertainment at home or you went to go see it somewhere. Uh, radio finally allowed us to bring it in the house. Then we moved from that naturally almost, you know, through my, uh, evolution through to TV. Then we started to have home entertainment systems, VCRs, DVDs, and so forth, um, followed eventually by streaming. But it was basically force fed to you. So when you would listen to the radio, you would have a schedule of things that you would listen to. And if you missed your show, you missed it, right? So we started getting specialized radio stations. That's where we get the sports talk radio. Yeah, formats. Yeah, you get your specialized formats. I remember, you know, as a kid back in the 70s, when you would listen to the radio, you would hear every genre of music on, on a radio station. You didn't even have specialized target audiences Back in the 70s, mm -hmm. you didn't start getting that until mid-80s, late-80s. And TV channels started doing the same thing. You know, I, I, I'm going to sound like my father at this point, but, you know, going back to when I was a kid, we didn't have cable. We had broadcast television. You had 3, 6, and 10 in our area. CBS, ABC, and NBC. And uh, if you were lucky, you'd get a PBS station. But outside of that... You know, that was what your entertainment was. We've come a long way since then. Yeah. We've gone the complete opposite way. Now, now people can have access to everything, which I think a lot of people realize is too much. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. And it, what happened was when we got to the point where there were certain things we wanted to watch, uh, the advent of the VCR kind of gave us that option where you could set your VCR if you were, you know, a rocket scientist, you could figure out how to program your VCR to actually record on a timer, assuming the power didn't go out and it lost its time. <laughs> you know, there was a, a lot of factors involved in getting this technology to work at the time. Um, so you would record your programs and then watch them after, after the fact. You didn't have streaming. You didn't have DVRs even at the time. Yeah. And I think something that I'm sure, well, I don't want to get too far in uh, ahead of ourselves, but one of the things we'll probably talk about is how, as a, as a society, we've kind of, we all like when it was the radio, everybody would gather around and listen to the radio at the same time all around the world. So you'd all listen to, 
you know, something at 8 p.m. on a Thursday every week. Everybody would do that. But then as we kind of went further and further down the timeline, viewing experiences became more individualized yeah. where now it's not everybody tunes in Sunday to watch something. I mean, you still get that with like sports, but for things like like Game of Thrones, right? I mean, that was kind of the last big thing that everybody would tune in and watch except for things like reality shows like The Bachelor and things like that. Those are usually still watched live. But big entertainment moments like that are getting more and more rare as, you know, people can watch and stream whatever they want whenever they want. Yeah, and it's it's a very intimate experience mm-hmm. where you get to you get to build your entertainment yeah. consumption experience yourself. And we didn't start being able to do that until we got technology like the VCR. Yep. Uh, outside of that, it was you were watching stuff on a schedule. We got smart cable at some point in time in the 90s where you started getting video on demand. Where you were able to go in through your cable box and say, all right, I want to watch a movie now, whatever time it is. And they would charge you for that and and they would send you a bill for the pay-per-view experience. So there's been a significant evolution and, and a lot of that's been driven by the technology. Nowadays we have streaming and Mm -hmm. and everything is streaming. Now this podcast is streaming, (laughs) uh, television streams. You have, you have television networks, news networks that have no presence whatsoever on broadcast television. They stream entirely over the internet. So it's a, it's a, almost a paradigm shift in how we get our entertainment and our information these days. So that's sort of the primer of how we want to approach this. We're going to come back after a quick break and we're going to talk about the history of some of these things. And we'll we'll look at some of the milestones and see just how far we've come from a technology standpoint. We'll be right back. Insights into Teens, a podcast series exploring the issues and challenges of today's youth. Talking to real teens about real teen problems. Explore issues from braces to puberty, social anxiety to financial responsibility. Each week, we talk about the topics concerning today's youth. We look at how the issues affect teens, how to cope with these issues, and how parents, friends, and loved ones can help teens handle these challenges. Check out our video episodes on youtube.com backslash insights into things. Catch our audio versions on podcast.insightsintoteens.com or on the web at insightsintothings.com. We're talking entertainment a la carte today. I'm your host, Joseph Whalen, and I'm Sam Whalen is with me today. So over the air, you know, for, for the longest time, broadcast radio and television was a community service. All the way back starting in 1926 when NBC first started the na- first national broadcast. It's not quite that simple anymore, is it? It's It's not free open over the air anymore is it no i mean back then even before the first national radio network and i only know this because i took a class on this last uh semester so you know i gotta make that education worth it (laughs) um it was only there were two channels um am and one was for crops and weather reports and the other was entertainment which was mostly music and like bible verses so that was what radio was mostly for and it was localized because there wasn't any kind of national network so it was basically anybody could do it and you could broadcast it anywhere um, but then when you had NBC come along, it sort of became that network. And nowadays it's, I mean, it's so far, it's still local in a sense because you'll have local stations, but for most of them, like, um, we have a local rock station here, WMMR, and you can tune in that dial 93.3, but also they have a streaming app, right? right? So they get all the time people all across the world tuning in and listening and, you know, they, they archive their morning shows and you can tune in live and listen to their music. So it's. It's not, you don't need a radio to listen to the radio anymore, basically. Exactly. And in in fact, you know, it's funny you mention that. 
cell phones all have radio receivers on them. Mm -hmm. Most people don't realize that. There are apps that you can get that will tap into the radio antenna on your phone and allow you to do it. And you know, we we'd had a hurricane come through a couple of years back and uh, we lost power. So we didn't have any battery powered radios. So we actually wound up downloading the app because we still had cellular coverage. And we had an app that allowed us to get uh, weather radios basically built into our phone. So broadcast radio is still going very strongly out there. But it doesn't give us that personalization that I think we're looking for. Uh, a lot of radio stations that do stream, they'll stream multiple streams. And you can basically pick the streams that you want, pick the channels that you want. Because a lot of our radio networks are multi-format network. So you might have Clear Channel being one of the network. And that network may have 50 different radio stations across the country but you don't have over-the-air rights to, to get most of those because of the limitations of the technology. But they'll stream all of those on their website. So you can literally listen to a radio station from Ohio or California or whatever. So technology has given us that ability to choose at this point in time. And, and as technology has evolved, you know, we've gone from AM to FM where we can broadcast further, high fidelity, and so forth. What do you think about satellite radio? Satellite radio, XM first introduced satellite radio in early 2000s. The biggest deal that they probably ever had was when they brought in Howard, Howard Stern. Stern. How do you think that impact has had? Because it's subscription-based. Mm. It's not free. Right. Um, and most cars today, if you buy a new car, have an XM radio built into it. Do you think satellite radio gives you that that customization of your entertainment choice i think it's definitely it was at the time it was definitely a precursor to what we ended up seeing with things like netflix and hulu and things like that just for radio and especially with howard stern because he wasn't censored that was like the big appeal of it but what a lot of people forget is before howard stern went to satellite he was against it like vehemently he was all about terrestrial radio but then when his fines like almost bankrupted his station you know he, he had really no choice um, but yeah, I definitely think it was a, it was a kind of a precursor and you can customize it to an extent, but I think that subscription sort of is kind of a barrier to entry to a lot of people. It's a barrier to entry to me because not only did I not want to pay the subscription, but I also don't have a radio that can use it. You know, I got it for free a little while, like a trial a while yeah. back and I was using it on my phone. But if I'm going to use my phone to listen to something, I'm probably just going to listen to a podcast. So, and without having it in a car you know, there's that entry there. So if you're buying a new car and you get it for free for three months or, you know, included, I can definitely see you using it. Um, not to mention that you do have a lot of great personalities and great stations on satellite radio that there's most likely something for everybody. Yeah. And, and I'll tell you, when I bought my new car, it, it came with that three months of XM free. And the problem that I had with that is the same problem that I have with cable television today. And we'll get into a little bit more. Yeah, it, it's 180 channels yep. and how do I find what I want to listen to? Uh, it was an overwhelming experience to have that much choice. And it's kind of ironic because it's that choice that we've demanded for years now. You know, I want the ability to make my entertainment selections the way that I want. And television's kind of evolved the same way that radio did. You know, it started out in its infancy. You had very few stations that you could see anything with, and everything was over the air. And then, you know, they came to the point where you were able to make money off of it. And most most contracts, most money that you get out of television, at least in the early days, was all advertising. Whereas you get into the cable uh, model and you, you get into more of a subscription type model. But, you know, television was first introduced in the early 20s at the World's Fair. And then in 31, by 1931, you had 40,000 televisions in the United States. You had two networks transmitting at that time. And they were local stations. You had to be in those local areas, New York being one of the markets. 
Um, and somewhere out in the Midwest, I forget where the other market was. But it wasn't until 1936, and not even in our country, but in the BBC, before you get dedicated programming. And BBC opened up with three hours of programming. Can you imagine a television station with three hours of programming? I mean, like, what do you do at that point in time? I mean, it's a pretty big three hours, right? I mean, if nobody had ever seen, nobody had ever seen anything like this before. So those three hours, people were probably, you know, enraptured by this thing. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of parallels between TV and radio and their evolution. Um, and you see that a lot with this because radio didn't have programming all the time either until much later. I think it was like the seventies when that became like, and, or maybe that was TV where it wouldn't just shut off at night. Yeah. I mean, as a kid, I remember at yeah. midnight or one o'clock in the morning. You know, your, your TV stations, you'd see a, a picture, a, a video of the American flag. Mm -hmm. They play the national anthem and then he'd shut off until eight o'clock the next morning when the news and started. For not like for modern audiences, that's an insane concept because now it's again, we're, and then we keep making this comparison, but it's the complete opposite where you're just inundated with content all yeah. the time. Yeah. And, and you saw some monumental achievements in television, like in 67, when, when we get PBS where it's publicly funded broadcasting, you know, they mandated children's programming with children's television workshop in 1969 with Sesame Street. So you had a lot of positive things come out based on demand. And I think that's really the important thing is as people started to consume the media that was out there, they realized they wanted more. They wanted specific programming. They wanted specific shows. They wanted to, to watch their local sports franchises. And as a result of that, you started to see more specialized television networks come out. And a lot of that fell over into the cable industry as well. Because there's only a, cer a certain amount that you can get out of an over-the-air broadcast with television at the time. And really, the latest, the late, Latest, biggest innovation over the air television wasn't until 2009 when they went all digital, which I got to tell you, that was a real monster to deal with because you had people throughout the country who didn't have cable, couldn't afford cable, and they were getting all of their, their news and sports and everything over, over the air broadcasts. And with the, the mandate to move to all digital, and the reason for the all digital is because of how much more data you can put out over a digital signal than you ever could over an analog signal. And you see now with digital subscript, which with digital transmissions, you know, your local ABC station might be putting out five different channels over the bandwidth that used to use for one. So there was a definite benefit to it. But it also required everyone to replace all their equipment, which is expensive. So much so that when they went through this process, federal government actually subsidized it. And you could go to the government and get a coupon oh, really? to buy a digital antenna wow. at the time. And the program ran for like 18 months or something like that. I remember when it, when it ran. And uh, they funded it with, you know, a ludicrous amount of money. And even after that fact, people still didn't have it because of how inaccessible it was for a lot of people. There's a lot of televisions that sit around right now that have no function whatsoever because nothing's broadcasting on frequencies they can receive. So then we move into, you know, the natural progression, I think, is cable television. And it's funny because in, in doing the research for the podcast today, I learned a lot about cable television that I didn't know. The fact that it's existed since 1948 blew my mind. Like, I came, my, when I grew up, I, I came from a, a fairly underprivileged house. We didn't have a lot of money coming in. So my dad did not subscribe to cable for a very long time. But uh, I kind of thought he was just sort of behind the times in the 70s not realizing that cable's been around since the 1940s. So that was a that was a big thing for me to realize it. But cable television progressed I think at a rate much faster 
than over the air transmissions did. Because you make a lot more money from it. <laughs> and that's that's exactly it. You have people that are paying you, you know, it, in 1950, Tuckerman Appliance, an appliance store that sold TVs, started their own cable network. Could you imagine that today? One of the biggest radio stations in Philly was uh, originally was from a appliance store. Right. Appliance stores were, were like they they had a lot of power. <laughs> yeah, back in the day. it was they would they would buy their feeds and then they would send it out to their customers. And people in Arkansas were paying three dollars a month for cable, and it was because they were they were rural households that weren't close enough to a transmitting station. So they'd physically run a cable out there and then wire up the little net, the little town. So in 1972, you start getting into specialized television channels. You get HBO. And then that sort of opened up the Pandora's box, you know, to use a bad pun there. You started in the 80s and 90s, you really started getting channels. You got channels for everything. You got channels for cooking. You got multiple channels for cooking. You got home shopping channels. You got multiple music television channels, none of which, ironically, play music anymore. <laughs> These were what were categorized as narrow casting channels. Um, and some of these, which, was, which is kind of interesting, they started out as regional. Like, for instance, um, Sports Channel New York started out as just regional sports broadcasting. And that eventually evolved into spot, uh, Fox Sports. So from humble beginnings to a yeah. major player in the sports franchise market now. Um, you had other things like um, BET, Black Entertainment Television. That's a channel all and of its own with its own award-winning programming today. Started out as a segment on USA networks. So they had a, a couple of hours a week that they would broadcast it. And eventually there was such a demand for it that they came out with an entire network for it. And that's what I'm talking about. Like very specialized networks. Uh, you've got sci-fi network, you've got history, you've got multiple history channels. So the, the idea of catering to all of these entertainment needs was fulfilled in the specialized networks, these specialized channels on cable TV. But you still didn't have the ability to get what you want when you want it. You were still bound to yep. a schedule. And that's really what's probably held cable television back for the longest time until the 19, late 1990s, early 2000s. You started to get your video on demand. You started to get more pay-per-view. So you could, if you wanted to watch a boxing match or a wrestling match or whatever it was, you could pay for it, one-time fee, get it, and watch it with all your friends. The real shift, I think, in cable TV came with TiVo and DVR, where you could time shift your entertainment now. So now TiVo, TiVo was unique in the business because... It had a very intelligent algorithm. So as you would record certain programs, it would associate those programs with ones you're not recording and then offer you suggestions on what you might like. So then you can sort of pick and choose the shows that you want and get them a la carte. That was really the first a la carte entertainment package you had. The problem with that was that you still had to subscribe to all of those channels. And I think the downfall that cable has always had, when you go to your cable company and you want to get a subscription, there's multiple packages that you have to choose from. And yeah, you can pay through the nose and get the super deluxe and get everything, but you might want to just get one of the channels and one of the packages and you have to take all of them. So the, the, the cord cutters of the world in the 2000s got to the point of trying to find ways to not have to subscribe to all those channels and just get what you want. And that leads us up to sort of where we are today with all the streaming options. Yeah. I mean, that's that 
option, that ability to pick and choose challenges and the entire marketing platform for things like Sling, where yeah. you can pick and choose your channels, or I think Hulu Live TV does that too. Well, even Sling. So Sling and Hulu Live give you packages that you can choose from. You can't choose individual oh, okay. channels. Okay. So it's not as bad as the cable company. Yeah, it's still cheaper. <laughs> it's much cheaper than the cable company. But the problem that you run into now is all that's delivered to you is digital content over the internet. Yeah. So you have to worry about your internet speeds. Absolutely. So you have internet companies that are, you have cable companies that are becoming internet companies. And in doing that, you run into what is often referred to as the, um, uh, monopoly. <laughs> Well, no, they've been monopolies for a long time. Net neutrality. Oh, okay. So, and with net neutrality, the concept behind net neutrality is data is data. Doesn't matter where it is, where it comes from, what it contains, it's data. It should all be treated the same. And the cable companies want their data to be treated better than others. And Netflix ran into this very early on with a lot of the cable companies, Cox Cable, Comcast and a few others where they were throttling the bandwidth that people were using for Netflix. So you may have an unlimited agreement with your cable company for data, but if they see that the majority of the data that you're using comes from outside their network from Netflix, they throttle it. You see a lot of buffering, your quality goes down and they're trying to push their own video on demand services instead which they don't count against your bandwidth caps. So none of this has been resolved. This is still yeah. a problem. But what's happening is cable companies are becoming less about providing cable and more about becoming internet companies in general. And until all that sort of washes out, we're going to have a fight on our hands here because they're losing money. And, and they try to get it back by offering you bundles. So, for instance, if all you need is internet, it's cheaper for you to get internet, cable, and phone than just internet for the first year. After that, the rates go up, but they lock you into a two-year deal, minimum usually. So, you know, I can't blame the cable companies. They're trying to make a buck. That's their job. But in the end, it's the consumers that wind up paying for it. Yeah, and even now, I mean, we have Xfinity and you can you can watch Netflix and Hulu and Amazon Prime all through Xfinity. So I mean, I'm sure there's there's kind of handshakes there where they kind of meet in the middle and they say, "Well, okay, Netflix, we'll host your platform here. You'll get a lot more viewers, but you still have to subscribe to Netflix to access those services. Right. You don't you don't get any of that for free. I think with Xfinity, you only get like Peacock for free because it's NBC, Comcast, it's the same company. Um, but those kind of they're kind of merging now, and we're just gonna have a big old blob of media eventually that's just everything <laughs> well and it's funny you mention that because the solution that netflix eventually came up with was they would implant caching servers in the cable providers and they would pay the cable providers a certain amount of money they would put a physical box inside their network so when you went to watch if you went to stream game of thrones off of netflix it would download from netflix's home server to the caching server there you would watch it but anybody else who went to watch Game of Thrones would pull it from that caching server. So the result of that was it didn't put a demand on the backbones, the internet backbone connections that the cable companies had. So that was an exclusive deal they offered to Netflix that they're not offering to other uh, streaming providers either. And I'm not even sure they're still offering. There's some debate whether or not they're still offering that service. I know Comcast was having a, a bit of an issue with that where they stopped offering it to Netflix. But it's all, you're right, it's you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, and we'll all make a buck off of the end consumer. Not to mention now, I mean, you've got Disney, in, which now effectively owns Hulu because they own Fox, right? right? So it's a lot of that programming too. So it's not just, these streaming companies are not like small businesses. <laughs> They're all, I mean, I don't think Netflix is owned by any major corporation. No, right? Netflix is still independent. Yeah, and then Amazon obviously is a mega corporation. So you know, the streaming service is just a portion for the mo for most of these companies, just a portion of their revenue. Right. I mean, except for Netflix, but even then, I mean, they're still 
they've moved more into film produ- and you know production in general too. So they're more of a they're not just streaming anymore. They're making a lot of their own content as well. And it, you know, it's interesting to mention that. So so we talked over the radio, television, and cable. The alternatives that we had to get our a la carte fix of entertainment were VCRs. You know, the, the VCRs came out in the 1970s. They became popular in the 80s. Blockbuster video became uh, opened in 85. So if you wanted to watch a movie, you could a la carte on demand, go down and get a movie and bring it home and watch it. As long as you rewound, rewound it, you were fine. DVDs became the alternative. They were much more convenient, higher quality. First DVDs were released in 97. Blockbuster started carrying them in 2001. They, they kind of missed the boat on that a certain amount. Hollywood Video actually started DVD rentals as soon as they became available. But the one interesting thing with uh, Blockbuster was when Blu-ray came out, there was, as, just like with VCR, when, when VHS came out, you had Betamax as an alternative. When DVD, uh, HD Blu-rays came out, you had HD video. And when Blockbuster had such a huge portion of the market that they decided that they were going to go Blu-ray. And as soon as that happened, it basically was the end of life for HD DVD at that point. Um, so they had such a huge segment of the market that they could make that kind of demand. But then you see other services like Redbox pop up. You know, you see Redbox is all over the place still, even though a lot of people are streaming stuff. I think Redbox is a streaming service too. Like they I do. Think you can stream, and I think they make, they have their own original things. Like, I don't know if they make it, like, I don't know if they produce it like Netflix does, but they can definitely license or and stream a lot of stuff on their own site as well. Yeah. So... So, and, and then streaming, you know, streaming really started in, in the early nineties. The problem you had was your data connections. Um, the first practical codex for streaming, the compression algorithms for streaming came out in 92, but 92 was also when we had 33 K bald modems. You didn't have your high speed data connections, your cable modems, your DSL, even at that time. So that kind of killed a lot of what you could do with it there. But the real streaming services itself didn't start until 2005 when YouTube uh, opened up business. And and at the time, YouTube and and streaming was, you know, YouTube was where people posted their videos. It was the TikTok of today. That's what YouTube was. You didn't have professionally produced content that was going up there. Nowadays... Every streaming service, Netflix, Disney, obviously, YouTube, uh, Hulu, they're all producing their own television shows to the point that you have award shows that are controversial because you have TV awards for streaming services, streaming services yeah. that never appear on TV. Yeah. I think the Emmys, like the, I think more, maybe more than the majority was mostly all from streaming services. Yeah. So there was, there was really a fundamental shift probably 2013, 2014 to, to more streaming. So that, you know, that's a history. It's, it's important to know where we came from with our entertainment. You know, we, we get up to that 2015 mark there and we're still stuck with 180 channels with nothing to watch. And that's really where the problem came from. And the demand for cord cutters and the demand for a la carte entertainment. So we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and then we'll talk about where we are today with cable TV and all these other outlets. See who's a player, who's not a player anymore. And then we'll take a look at where we're going. seven years, the Second Sith Empire has been the premier community guild in the online game Star Wars The Old Republic. With hundreds of friendly and helpful active members, a weekly schedule of nightly events, annual guild meet and greets, and an active community both on the web and on Discord. 
The Second Sith Empire is more than your typical gaming group. We're family. Join us on the Star Forge server for nightly events such as operations, flashpoints, world boss hunts, Star Wars trivia, guild lottery, and much more. Visit us on the web today at www.thesecondsithempire.com. We are talking entertainment a la carte today. So we've looked at the history of it. We've sort of set the stage here. Let's take a look at where we are today as far as cable TV goes. So we're still running packages on, on TV channels today. So we haven't really changed much there, have we? There is an increasing push to cut the cord with different services. We've got enough streaming services out there, as long as you have a good internet connection. Uh, now, the one thing to mention here that I actually didn't put in the notes, that's the, the new satellite internet network that uh, Elon Musk is putting out. So it will be possible very soon to have low latency satellite internet, high speed internet, and not have to deal with your cable company. Of course, when that happens, God help you if you're an astronomer, because you're not going to be able to look at anything up in the sky now without seeing one of these satellites. Net neutrality. We mentioned it earlier on. One of the biggest problems with net neutrality is, the, is that the FCC determines what is and isn't net neutrality. And the FCC is traditionally chaired by someone from the telecommunications industry. So it doesn't look good for consumers from that perspective. What are your thoughts on, you know, net neutrality and, and whether or not it's an issue moving forward? Is it an issue today? Is it a non-issue? Should we not even worry about it now? I, I definitely think it's an issue. Um, and I do think, I mean, I don't, I think people underestimate how important it is really. And I, I know every time the, you know, the bills and things go up for net neutrality, there's always petitions online, you know, contact your congressman, things like that. But I don't think people take it that seriously. And I don't think they really understand how a lack of net neutrality will really impact them. You know, and I think it's, it's the more subtle ways that I find the most dangerous where we talked about before, how you can manipulate the consumer to get rid of a product like Netflix or something like that, because you can't stream it because of your internet. Right. But it's so subtle that you'll just chalk it up to, Oh, my speeds are just low. Yeah. Right. But there's, a company behind the scenes that are that's pulling those strings and that is manipulating you and you might not even realize it. So I think that net neutrality is extremely important for those reasons because it it's just another element that can be used to manipulate consumers, which I, I get is the whole point of a business basically is to get people to continue buying your product. But I think when it's something so universal like that, where the internet should probably be a utility that everybody has access to, but it's not that yet, and it's not looking like it's going to go that way either. Um, if the patterns that we're seeing now continue, it looks like a lot of people are going to have restricted access where the Internet should be a free and open resource for everybody. Yeah, and I, and I agree. And you touched on it earlier when you mentioned cable companies and monopolies. And, mm -hmm. and this is really them behind a curve. You know, not not getting with the program here because there's a lot of things. Te technology moves much faster than cable companies. Cable company lawyers can move. You know, we're looking at satellite uh, communications that have exploded at this point. You're looking at alternatives like uh, Verizon Fios where you can get fiber run right to your house. You're looking at 5G now where... You know, once the 5G networks are built out, you won't need to have a wired connection to your house, at least if you buy into the hype. Yeah, but it's going to make all our heads explode, haven't you heard? And cause coronavirus. Yeah, yeah I know. It's going to turn us into zombies. <laughs> um, but you can get cable, you can get over the air speeds for your internet now that are comparable to your cable connection that are more than enough to stream video. So I think... I think if nothing else, the cable companies have a real problem ahead of themselves. Um, they've got too many outlets that people have 
I'll turn to this for because cable companies thrive when you didn't have options. And, you know, a lot of this started in the 90s when cable companies started gobbling up all the regional cable providers. And you start having giants emerge like Comcast, where you have entire regions of the country that don't have an alternative to cable, phone, or internet, but Comcast. So you don't have a choice but to go with that. But it's not a monopoly. <laughs> but that, right, it's, that's not a monopoly because it's only regional. <laughs> yeah. But I think the problem is that they've had that level of monop- monopolistic protection for so long now that they don't realize that, that they're really threatened at this point in time. So I don't know where cable is going to go. It's, it's an endangered species right now, but it doesn't realize it. Yeah, I think you're seeing a little bit of that with things like Peacock, where Xfinity, which is Comcast, which is NBC, is trying to get into that streaming market. But I don't know, maybe it's just me, but Peacock seems like it's really late to the game. And they don't really seem like they have a whole lot to offer other than things they already own, like reruns of like Cheers and Frasier, which used to be on Netflix, but it looks like they are they were just flexing that they own the rights to these shows, so they put it on their own streaming service. But it doesn't seem like it's enough to make them a competitor for something like Netflix or Hulu because it's not making what separates companies like our, our services like Netflix and Hulu and Amazon is that they're making their own shows like we mentioned before. But with things like Peacock, if you're just rebroadcasting essentially content that everybody's already seen and just wants to watch reruns, I don't think that's going to make you enough of a competitor in the market. And I think that if it, if that's their attempt to keep their cable company status, but also dip their toe in the streaming water, I don't think it's going to be enough. And, and I think that's a great segue to the streaming services in general. So the, what really got me on this topic was there was an article on CNET. Uh, I, I think the, the person who did the research or wrote it was Ashley Esketha who, who wrote it up. And she went through and ranked 101, quote unquote, major streaming services. And she ranked them based on price, the number and quality of original programming, the number and quality of their back catalog, their overall uh, variety, and what their availability was for subscribers. And it was kind of eye-opening to me that there were 101 major streaming providers out there. Well, I mean, major, I don't know about that, because on this list we have, what is it, the top, we have the top 10 here. This is just the top 10. And I haven't heard of one of them, so I don't know how major it is. I've never heard of Acorn TV. I don't know what that is. Well, and that's like Acorn. So, like, if you use uh, Plex or Kodi or any of the media streaming service players at home, Acorn TV you would know. Acorn Acorn TV is like a free add-on that you can get for it. And think of it like the me TV of streaming where it's like some of the nostalgic stuff. stuff. Yeah. All right. That makes sense. But a lot of them are like that. I mean, you had ones on here that were, they were rated much lower because they didn't have, they were so specialized. So for instance, NFL networks has a streaming service. NHL does. WWE does. All the sports basically. Right. So they didn't rate very high because they didn't have a, a very wide variety. But the fact that there's 101, this 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 goes back to the I want it, I want it now, and I want it the way I want it. So instead of having 180 channels with nothing on, we now have 101 streaming networks that we now have to sort through now. Yeah, and the argument used to be from cord cutters is like, well, if you add up all the streaming services, it's still less than a cable bill. But within like three years, that is not a valid argument anymore because, right. I mean, I personally have Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix – Disney Plus, and I guess whatever HBO has now, but I think that's included with my cable. So it's like that's like five right there. Well, and HBO has three different streaming <laughs> services that they offer. Yeah, yeah, they have HBO Now, HBO Max, and then HBO Go. Is that the Go thing? is the new one? Yeah, and I have no idea what any of them are. Right, like I have HBO Max and I I barely use it, but I have it and I know where to access it, but I don't know what HBO Now and HBO Go are. Right, and that's the thing. Like we've gotten to the point now. Where we wanted to be able to to basically go to the cable company and say, all right, I want 50 channels. These are the 50 channels I want. Give them to me and charge me a reasonable rate. We never got that. Instead, what we got was 
You go to your cable company. Here is your boom. There's your package. Oh, and if you want all this other stuff, because you have stuff that are exclusive to the streaming networks. So if I want to watch Star Trek, I can't watch Star Trek on cable anymore. I have to have a subscription to CBS All Access to watch anything Star Trek. And that's one of the things that like really bothers me about all these companies coming out of the woodwork and making their own streaming service because it just seems like, like I mentioned before with Peacock, it just seems like they're flexing their muscles and saying, oh, no, these are ours. Right. Like that happened with The Office on Netflix. Who was that? Uh, was that Peacock or was that somebody else? I can't even keep trying. I think it was Peacock. They had it on on someone. Yeah. And they pulled it. I think it was on Netflix. Yeah. They pulled it off and they put it on some. And, on and Friends network. was like that too. And again, it's the shows where you're just rebroadcasting green runs. But it was, it's a show that a lot of people like. And now they have to pay another $10 a month to watch it. And they're probably not gonna. And Disney did the same thing. Yeah, exactly. You look at all the Marvel TV shows that Disney had on Netflix that were, for the most part, good. They canned and, them all. And they canned them all. But they didn't even bring them over to their own network yet. Yeah, they're even though they, they tease people as if they were going to, right. and they haven't yet, and I doubt they're going to. Right. It's been too long. So so I don't think we're any better off today than we were 10 years ago. It's just everything that you have now, and if they're, they all price themselves at either 5 or 10 bucks a month. And it's like, okay, well, if I get the 50 channels or the 50 streaming services that I want, I'm paying more for my service now than I would have through cable. Oh, and I still have to pay for my internet. So I'm getting more because I'm getting on-demand back catalogs. I'm getting original content. The top 10 of these probably all, with the exception of Acorn, I don't know if Acorn does, they all do original content. So I'm probably getting more things to watch, but the price is going up exponentially at this point. Yeah, I mean, I know in my house, I've been a strong advocate of we don't need cable, right? But I'm not the only one in the house, obviously. Like my mom, she watches a lot of live TV and she records a lot of things live. But there are also things that I'm pretty sure are available on some of these services. Like she watches Big Brother and I'm pretty sure that's on CBS All Access because that's the network at Arizona, I think. I'm sorry if there's Big Brother fans out there and I'm wrong about that. But that's the thing too, because it's like, and like my grandma doesn't really understand how streaming stuff works, but she can get on her Roku TV and put on ABC and stream the live TV. So she doesn't need a cable box. And it's like, that's like a whole nother layer to it where it's, it's live TV, but then you're streaming it through a streaming service, which you then have to pay for. But some of these, you need a cable subscription to access like the live TV for the ABC. You need a cable service to log into it. So it's like all these layers of, of media and they're all kind of intertangled so that you end up having to keep all of it and pay for all of it. When I don't really think you'd need to, you know? You're absolutely right. And it's probably and, by design that way. <laughs> well, and and the amount of overhead that this creates now causes all of the bills to go up even higher because the cable companies now have to pay for the broadcast versions. They have to pay for the streaming versions. There are different revenue sources that come out of it through advertising now, obviously. But for the end consumer, you're not – better off you're not you're not getting what you were looking for you know we wanted to have everything on demand for us and and all these networks were like well this is what you asked for it's all on demand now you know you need to have 50 subscriptions if you want to get your 50 channels and i think the the appeal is with something like cbs all access well okay you you don't you might not want to get our streaming service because it's you think it's just rerun so we're going to make something like star trek or like the three different versions of star trek and, okay, that's new content. You can come here and watch that. But not everybody might want to do that, right? And if they don't like the new Star Trek, then they're not going to subscribe to that service. But if they forget, which is, I think, what most of these companies count on, yep. forgetting to cancel your subscription, then they get that $10 every month, even if you're not using it. And they don't care if you're using it or not. You know, it's funny you mention that. Netflix actually got to the point where they had so many hangers on like that that they introduced a service you know, without being asked for it that they monitor whether or not you watch the service if you use it. If you haven't used it in a year, they'll notify you and cancel your subscription oh, wow. for you. 
I mean, they're making so much money, it probably is negligible, but they are. it's just to improve they their are. like public image. That's a helpful service, though, because I'm, I mean, I still pay for, and this is totally different from this, but like in terms of forgetting subscriptions, I still pay 99 cents a month for cloud storage. I haven't had an iPhone in like three years, but every time I go to cancel it, it's so many steps to cancel it that I just like, well, you can have my 12 bucks a year, you know? Yeah. And that's, that's Apple for you. Yeah. <laughs> so outside of cable and streaming, there are other options. Us being one of them, us being podcast being one of them. And there's a ton of sources for podcasts. There's tons of podcasts out there that, that cater to every possible desire for cons a media consumption out there. And there's apps, you know, we talk about Instagram and Facebook uh, TikTok, well, we're, we're not talking about it too much now because Trump's trying to ban it. Nah, Microsoft will buy it. Microsoft and Walmart. Yeah. Just, comp just corporations, just vomit yeah, money. Yeah, they just care. throw money at it. <laughs> uh, and then you had someone who tried to corner the market with, I'm not even sure what, seven-minute segments? I think it's like 15 minutes. 15-minute segments. But it's all shot vertically, which is awful. <laughs> um, Quibi. <laughs> yeah. Um, who received a ludicrous amount of funding, like $2 billion in funding. A lot of big names attached to it. And, and yeah, they had a lot of celebrities and they had a huge number of people sign up for the free trial. Several million, like 15 million or something, sign up for the free trial. And then when that free trial ran out, they had about 70,000 people stick on. I mean, Quibi strikes me as the kind of thing that like, it makes it to the, the boardroom or whatever. And they're like, Oh, this is a great idea. Cause people love, like we looked at the numbers, right? We looked at the numbers and we saw that people are only watching in 15 minute increments because they're watching on their way to work on the train or something. Right. Or they're watching with their family and their, and their kid runs away. So they got to turn it off. So what if we just hyper focus on that? But then you realize because you're so caught up in the analysis and the numbers that that's not really going to work as a format because you end up having episodes that are really just trailers right? because they're only right. 15 minutes long. And when you shoot everything vertically, not only are you limiting the art form of like making movies and television, most people aren't going to watch things vertically. Like even if you're watching on your way to work on the train, you're still going to take the one second to turn your phone. Right. Like Quibi blows my mind. Well, <laughs> and, it's still a thing. and you couldn't share it with anyone. Oh, really? I you never You couldn't share clips. You couldn't share links. You couldn't share anything. That's good. That's great. When, like, the number one thing to social media sites like YouTube, TikTok, Facebook is the ability to share it. All the, like, Netflix, Hence too. Why it's social media. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Netflix <laughs> especially has a huge social media presence. Yeah. So, and that's so critical. And it's like, what do you so, and But I think, I guess my point is these options that we have here between podcasts and the apps, I think probably fill the gap of entertainment a la carte more than anything else right now, where we can go and find what we want. I can, I can download 50 different podcasts a week and pick and choose which ones that I want to consume. So I think that's probably more meeting the needs of the consumer than anything. Yeah. And I mentioned before that I watched a lot of YouTube and YouTube's just like that too. You can follow different channels that do different things, just like you'd subscribe to different podcasts. Like I follow a couple cooking channels. I follow a couple comic book based channels, um, you know, history channels. So there's something for everybody within each of these sections. Yep. Just like you can listen, like you said, to different podcasts. So I think if you want that a la carte, it's those places you're probably going to turn to because you can, because it's made by people, and it's not as heavily regulated. I mean, YouTube's pretty regulated, but something like a podcast, anybody can do a podcast, right? So you can, there's always something wow. for somebody, really? literally anybody. <laughs> I mean, anybody can do it. You just talk. <laughs> no, but, um, wow. <laughs> and make sure to subscribe to our podcast on your local podcast Good provider. Good thing you're not in our advertising department. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we just free plug, shameless advertising. Um, but yeah, I think that's where you get a lot of that a la carte, right? Because yeah, it's, you, I can, agree. you can find any kind of channel or any kind of podcast to meet your needs. I agree a hundred percent. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back with our gloom, doom and gloom section where we look towards the future. <laughs> Insights into Entertainment, a podcast series taking a deeper look into entertainment and media. Our husband and wife team of pop culture fanatics are exploring all things from music and movies to television and fandom. 
at the interesting and obscure entertainment news of the week. We'll talk about theme park and pop culture news. We'll give you the latest and greatest on pop culture conventions. We'll give you a deep dive into Disney, Star Wars, and much more. Check out our video episodes at youtube.com backslash insights into things. Our audio episodes at podcast.insightsintoentertainment.com or check us out on the web at insightsintothings.com. Entertainment a la carte, the future. How bad does it look? So let me ask you a series of questions. Is there a future for cable television? I don't know how long of a future it is, but I definitely think there is some. And, you know, I think it's probably just going to evolve. And you, you might not have a cable box, but I think especially Comcast is definitely trying to remain a presence in people's homes um, because they, you know, whether rebranding to a different name or offering more services based on tying Internet and cable together, I think that's where they're going to most likely head is is becoming both a cable company and an Internet company and kind of doubling down on that. All right, I'll buy that. How about traditional network broadcasting and schedules? Um, probably that'll probably stick around on cable. Um, and I know you have, you kind of have broadcasting sort of in the traditional sense and schedules on things like Twitch and YouTube where people will stream on a broadcast schedule. Um, so I think it might evolve into that where if you're looking at these new platforms, people will stick to a broadcast schedule, but instead of it being on three, six and 10, it'll be on twitch.tv slash, you know, whatever. Okay. How about commercial advertising and television? Are we still going to see million dollar minutes for Super Bowl ads? Oh, absolutely. That's the only reason a lot of these, like, that's radio's most valuable thing, too, is advertising, right? And it's where the money goes. So I definitely think that we'll definitely still see that because there's still people watching, even if a lot of it, if we're focusing a lot on streaming, they can still make a ton of money from commercial advertising. And the last question in Is There a Future is subscription television channels like HBO. Um, I'd probably have to look at the numbers for things like this to see if their subscriptions are going down. But I think with HBO, as an example, they're migrating over to streaming. So that's probably where it's going to go too. I mean, we had earlier Showtime was on that list too. So I think most of these channels, and I know WWE has one too. Um, so a lot of these channels are probably just going to go it, like, they'll probably keep their broadcast channel, but then also just, you know, improve their streaming side of things. Okay. So I wanted to ask some questions about streaming entertainment going forward. So TikTok was was popular, very popular. Um, so popular, in fact, that uh, they managed to tick off President Trump. What do you think about the precedent of Trump banning TikTok for reasons that were given that had no corresponding supporting evidence? That seems pretty par for the course if we're talking about Trump. But, I mean, I never use TikTok personally just because I don't, like, care about that kind of entertainment. But it is extremely popular. And if I had to wager, he probably did it, you know, to try to make, like, because he's very anti-China most of the time, right? Sure. So he says he tried to ban not just TikTok. There were a couple other things, too, all owned by Chinese companies that he was trying to go after. But when there was such a backlash to it, it just came off like another smoke bomb, right? Another distraction that he was going for, especially with TikTok because – he knows that he's, that's mostly used by youth, right? So that's going to be the most vocal about it. And if you're calling out a streaming or a social media platform, that social media platform is going to get way more traffic because exactly. the users over it are going to complain about you. So it just seemed like another distraction on, on his part. I think it was like almost immediately. I mean, he's still waving threats and stuff, but it looks like, like we said earlier, Microsoft and Walmart, which I didn't know about, yeah. were... Um, are moving in to buy it. So I doubt it's going anywhere. He probably just wanted to, you know, make a business deal or something. How about net neutrality? Do you think we have any hope of achieving net neutrality? Not with the current, I wouldn't, I would say not with the current administration. It doesn't seem like their track record does not show them leaning towards any kind of net neutrality. Um, it's probably going to take us a while and it's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And it would depend on the company's actions as well. Okay. 
5G technology, it's everywhere. Everyone's talking about it. Do you think 5G is going to be the end-all, be-all to give us the entertainment solution on our phones or in our homes that we're looking for? I don't think it'll be the end-all, be-all, but I think it's probably the next step. I mean, we see that with all the time. Technology always progresses, and it just seems like 5G is the next step in that. Um, obviously, there's the conspiracies, which I made a joke about earlier, but I think it's just people... I mean, when people, when like cars became more mainstream, they said there was going to be the end of the American family. Right. So I think people are just always hesitant to new technologies, regardless of what they are. But I think it's just another, it's just the next step for getting, you know, more entertainment and better technology. First run movies. We have a lot of our streaming services are running movies online now because of COVID and the fear of going to the movie theaters. Do you think think we'll be going back to the movie theaters like we were before or is a new model of streaming it at home going to be the way to go yeah this is this is tough my personal tinfoil hat theory is that i think disney's going to open their own theaters and i think that would be um what is the word it would violate some kind of law like the paramount decision or something like that but i think that was recently repealed so they can do it where they handle exhibition, distribution, and production, which right. is what they would be doing, which is a monopoly, which is supposed to be legal, but it's Disney, so they can probably get away with it. So that's my personal theory is that they're probably going to start buying up theaters. But if not, I mean, a lot of them have already f- filed or are going to file for bankruptcy most likely. And I don't I don't know how much people are going to want to go back because there's theaters open now. But I don't think like big movies like Tenet are still making money but not nearly as much as they should be making given their production. Plus what a normal Christopher Nolan movie would take. Um, I think it's difficult, you know, and I think there's also a lot of hesitant to put a lot of these movies on streaming services, even though they'd make a bunch of money. Um, and maybe not as much as you'd make with a traditional theatrical run, but you'd make a significant amount of money back, you know, and you wouldn't just have to cut your losses. Yeah. No, I agree with you there. The last question I'm asking, it's, it's not in the notes, but the last question I wanted to ask was, where do you think, do you think we'll ever reach that entertainment a la carte level where we'll get to pick and choose what we want and it would be affordable? I'd say probably not because the whole reason it's not a la carte is so that companies can make more money because you're roped into buying things you don't really need, which is, I mean, that's the whole point of business too. I said that earlier, but I'll say it again they're not going to make it that simple for the consumer. It's not designed to be pro-consumer. They'll give you what you think you want because you'll get, you know, this thing, but this thing will also come with all the other things that you're going to have to pay for. And I don't see that ever going away. It's If anything, it'll probably just increase. Yeah. I, and I sadly, I think you're right. I think the packaging aspect of things is too cost-effective for these distribution companies to move away from that. Yeah, and I mean, that method of packaging goes back to the beginning of modern entertainment, right? Of radio. I mean, you'd have formats, which yeah. are essentially packages because you'd listen to, you know, you might like sports, but you don't want to listen to sports all the time, but that's the format. And TV, again, what we talked about before, but with channels. So I think packaging is, has always been the way. And the reason it's been the way is because it works and it gets people's money and it, it furthers the industry in some kind of way. All right. Well, I think that was all the questions that I have. We'll come back. We'll get your closing remarks and thoughts and uh, end the show. So it wasn't too doom and gloom today, but what are your final thoughts on the entertainment industry, where we're going, where we're at, and is there hope for us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there's hope for us. I mean, <laughs> at least in this aspect of things, um, even if the world's burning outside, you can close your curtains and watch something on Netflix, right? Um, I think it's just like anything. I mean, I'm more focused I in the radio industry because that's what I'd like to go into one day. And I think with any industry, it's just going to evolve and it's going to change. I don't think they're going to go anywhere, at least not for the time being. I mean, cable might be a different story, but like I said, it's probably just going to evolve into something cable and internet, internet, you know? And, um, I think that's the name of the game is changing and evolving and, and not being resistant or hesitant to a lot of these new ideas. Um, where like you wouldn't want to release a new movie on streaming because the theaters are closed and you insist on putting it in theaters regardless of the situation. I, I think that's, there's that friction there of resisting change, which I can understand from someone like Chris Nolan's perspective where he wants his movie in theaters because that's what he made it for. It was designed to be watched that way. But I think the tides are just changing too fast. And if you want to make any sort of, if you want your art out there 
And if you want the profit from that art, I think you're going to have to, you know, just go with the flow of things, honestly. And, and you know, I think that's very well said. And I agree with you 100%. I think we're going to continue to evolve. Technology is going to push that evolution. And the people that are adaptable enough mm-hmm. to pick up on those things are the ones that are going to thrive in the future. So very well said. That was all we had today. I do want to reiterate uh, for folks out there that we do publish our long form articles on medium at medium.com slash insights into things. Uh, and please do subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Amazon. Uh, you subscribe and you'll get our podcast uh, the instant they're available, uh, Monday mornings at 8 a.m. Uh, please feel free to reach out to us at comments at insights into things. You can hit us on Twitter at insights underscore things. And I think that's it. Did you have anything else? Uh, just one quick thing. Um, if you have Amazon Prime, that means you have one Twitch Prime sum a bu- sub a month. And if you could help us out and support the channel that way, um, it does help us out because eventually we can help grow and expand our podcast, especially on Twitch, uh, bring it to you viewers out there. So. Very well said. Another one in the books. Bye.